TV. What if we weren't meant to struggle against sin? What if all the people who have told us all our lives that our primary purpose is to not sin and to struggle with it all the time, what if they're wrong? Well, I'm here to tell you that they are absolutely wrong. We are not meant to struggle against sin like Israel was meant to. There's a reason Israel was meant to. As I told you yesterday, that reason was to be a demonstration to the world that flesh and blood is not able to do the things of God. You're supposed to look at Israel and go, thank God I don't have to try that. But instead, people line up for it. Ooh, let me try that. What if that is wrong? What if there is another body of people called the body of Christ who were called not in accord with their acts and whose acts, whose sins even, have nothing whatsoever to do with God's choosing of them? In fact, what if they were chosen before sin even entered the universe? Wouldn't that be great news? Wouldn't it set you in a reclining mood and mode in order to just thank God every day that this is so <laughs> and that the lies we've been told, oh my God, the lies we've been told, the lies we've been told. I was raised in the Catholic Church, and every day we're fighting sin. And then once a month, you have to collect all your sins, and you sure have to remember them, and you have to recite them to the priest, and he'll give you certain prayers to pray, and you got to get through the so many Our Fathers, so many Hail Marys. And if you do that, and you don't miss a word, then maybe, maybe God will overlook your sin. This is a fossilized Israel thing. It's a leftover from Israel. It is a really ignorant dependence and calling upon something that is in the history books, something that's, whose purpose was to discourage everybody and reach for a savior. No, but these people are not properly discouraged in the Christian religion. They should be awfully, terribly discouraged, but they're not. They're fighting away, slugging away. We don't have to do this. We're the body of Christ. We are called irrespective of our acts. We are called before the disruption of the world. I told you yesterday that Israel was called from the disruption of the world. That is when sin began then Israel was hatched to combat sin. We were called before sin even entered the universe. Believers in Paul's gospel, the uncircumcision, are known before the disruption of the world. Remember the disruption of the world. It's when sin officially entered the universe. It entered the earth later through Adam. But listen to this in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blesses us with every spiritual blessing among the celestials in Christ, according as he chooses us in him before the disruption of the world, we to be holy and flawless in his sight. I want you to appreciate the wonder of this. There are no accidental words or phrases in God's revelation, and the person who pays attention to the details will thrive spiritually, will come to an understanding of how things are. What a difference between from and before. We were called in Christ before sin even entered the world. In other words, we were secure in him, locked in, locked down, chosen already designated before such a thing as failure or screw-ups even existed. You know what this means? This means that no failure or screw-up on your part can remo remove you from the body of Christ because the deal was sealed before there was failure or screw-ups. This is the most liberating thing you could hear. That's why we read in Romans 8, 38 and 39, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And Paul lists a bunch of things. Can this separate us from the love of God? How about this? How about this? I was told all my life that sin could separate me from the love of God, and I better stop it. And if I can't stop it, then I better confess it to the priest. And then I better say all the prayers, and then I better feel bad. I better 
give up things for Lent. That's why believers who follow Paul are in comparison to those who still think that they are meant to follow the Israelite gospel and still struggle against sin. That's why we are, let's put it this way, we're more relaxed. We're a little less tense about our failures. And just when you think that, oh no, this is going to cause people to sin even more, if you tell them that their security in Christ has been won in spite of what they do, oh, they're going to go nuts. They're going to sin like crazy. This isn't the case. The opposite is true. The prohibitions of the law just cause people to rebel against the prohibitions. But when you understand and believe that this thing really does operate, this thing. When I say this thing, I mean the love of God, the grace of God, God liking you. It exists completely irrespective of what you do. Speaking from my perspective, all I want to do is serve that God. It causes me to sin less. We've all had people go Israel on us. When I, when I say go Israel, that guy went Israel on me. That means Somebody came after you, harping on your behavior, threatening you with dire consequences if you don't shape up. If you don't shape up, God's going to ship you out. These are people getting Israel on you. These are people not understanding the purpose of Israel, and they're still trying to fulfill the law in the flesh instead of waiting for Jesus Christ to return and to give Israel a new heart. They're condemning, they're self-righteous, and they can't stand the fact that you aren't worried about it. How can you not worry? I'm on record as saying, and I'll say it again today, none of us should be worried about our sins. <gasps> How can I say that? How can you not worry about sins? Well, Philippians 4, 6, Paul said not to worry about anything. But the reason I'm not, that's, that just, that's all I need is that verse. Don't worry about anything, Paul says. So that would include my sin, right? Well, I'm not to worry about my sin. But there's a further foundation for this truth, and that is that members of the body of Christ, not members of the circumcision gospel, we were foreknown, called, designated beforehand, before the disruption of the world, before sin entered the universe. So the subsequent entrance of sin can't ruin what we have in Christ. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 8, 9, Suffer evil with the evangel in accord with the power of God who saves us and calls us with a holy calling, not in accord with our acts, but in accord with his own purpose and the grace which is given to us in Christ Jesus. This verse is revolutionary. This could be called, with a bunch of other verses, the unknown passage of Paul calls us with a holy calling, saves us, not in accord with our acts, good or bad. You can't impress your way into favor with God, and you can't sin your way out of favor with God. Why? Because again, we were chosen and sealed in Christ before Sin even entered the universe. Talk about security. Talk about security. So my question is, why in the world would anybody want to be an Israelite or a proselyte of Israel? Why would anyone struggle along that path unless it's out of pure ignorance? And I'm overemphasizing this. I'm overemphasizing this. I mean, you can go to parts of Scripture and read about the law of Moses and that God's commanding people to do all these things. Uh, the worst thing you can do to somebody is hand them the Bible and say, here, read this, read this. What are you doing to these people? You have to tell them where to read. Otherwise, they turn to Leviticus and they go, oh my God, look at all this stuff I have to do. Number one, you're not an Israelite. Number two, keep reading even in the Israel gospel and you'll find out that Israel fails continuously, and they must wait for a Savior, who they crucified the first time around, to return and to put a new heart in them. My, 
my question to anybody who keeps pursuing the Israel course is, do you like fighting sin? Is it, I guess on some days you might overcome it. That's the problem with this. You get victory on some day. Oh, we got victory. I got victory. You hear them saying that all the time. I got victory. Yeah. Well, let's see what happens tomorrow. That's just it. You're on constant probation. You're doing great today. Tomorrow, not so good. The next day, oh, I got victory. The next day, oh, Satan's after me. And um, I got to get... My, it's this constant roller coaster. We've all been on it in orthodoxy. It's a constant roller coaster of success, failure, success, failure, and there's more failure than success. You have one good day followed by 10 bad days. This war is completely unnecessary. This war is a war based on ignorance. That's why it's so, I, like I told you last week, it's so heartbreaking to see it because it's based on a lie. But Martin, it's in the Bible. Yeah, it's in the Bible to build an ark. But that was for Noah. It's in the Bible to follow the Ten Commandments. But that's for Israel. It's in the Bible to, you know, kill all the Amalekites. It's in the Bible. But we have to partition the Bible intelligently. Paul calls upon us to do this. He wrote to Timothy to, in the concordant version, correctly cut the word of truth. You have to look at the address on the envelope. You have to find out who God is writing to, when he's writing to them. What's the context? What's the the most important question? What's the evangel? Is it the evangel that God gave to Abraham, passed on to the terrestrial Jesus Christ, pass on to Peter, or is, the gospel, is it the gospel that God gave to Jesus Christ, the celestial Jesus Christ, the glorified Jesus Christ, who then passed it on to Paul, who wrote us 13 letters detailing our freedom and our salvation apart from works. That's the gospel I want. That's the gospel I want. And it's the gospel I got.